Hello, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage here at reInvent. We are on our 11th season of covering reInvent. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Dave Vellante is at the analyst session. We had a set down at the, in the floor yesterday, but we've been here four days covering reInvent. And the big story's been generative AI, but really the transformation of how businesses are now going to apply their data to solve business problems, but also change the interface to how people engage with applications and also spur on a tsunami, a feeding frenzy of developer activity with large language models and foundation models. And this segment, we've got featured guest MasterCard here, Manu Thapar, who's the CTO at MasterCard, and Drew Jenkins, AWS's Alliance Leader for Persistent. Um, congratulations on your uh, success called out by the CEO on stage yesterday for persistence and saving a 68% of developer productivity. 28%. 20, okay. 28. 68% is great, <laughs> but it was 28% and yeah, yeah, we're very happy to see that. And that's very a real payback for the work you guys have been doing with AI. Certainly. We'll get to that later. Yeah. Uh, Manu, thanks for coming on. Uh, CTO of MasterCard, uh, well-known uh, financial services. You've been doing big data for a long time, right? Yes. <laughs> and now AI, generative AI in particular, highlights that next level, legit next level capabilities that are coming online. Absolutely. If you have the data. Take, take a minute to explain where you guys are at right now. Yeah, so I'm CTO uh, for uh, some of the value added services uh, at MasterCard, and by that I mean uh, when um, we use the credit card uh, that goes through the MasterCard network, but it also gets scored for probability of fraud using AI. We've been doing this for a very long time, number of years, and on an ongoing basis, about 2% of the transactions are denied, which ends up saving merchants billions of dollars. And we generate revenue uh, that way, and it's a growing revenue, very well growing. In fact, it's the fastest growing portion of MasterCard's revenue. Now with uh, uh, generative AI, coming in last year, uh, that's sort of captured the imagination of a lot of people. Uh, all of us have used it, tried it in the form of chat GPT, uh, but some of the fundamental concepts of large language models, yeah. which can be used for language generation, uh, can also be used for code generation, and we're using that, uh, looking at that to improve developer productivity, of course. Uh, but uh, we're also looking at ways to extend generative AI uh, for yeah. improving the rest of the business. You know, it's interesting, and, and I really appreciate you for you, what you guys do. I know how hard it has been and to do data at that scale. But generative AI, I mean, open AI and ChatGPT, that's a chatbot interface on data. Okay, yeah. so it's great. Okay, it's not that, okay, I like it. But what it did was it educated everybody. That's like, right. Mm -hmm. This is new, it's magic. Yeah. You know, streaming words on a screen, oh, it helps me write, co-pilot kind of vibe. I think that educated the mainstream of an expectation. And this shift from SaaS to now generative is non-deterministic, right? Yeah. So, you, you know, SaaS was easy, deterministic, non-deterministic. So the, the shift in culture and also tech stack impact, mm -hmm. yeah. which we yeah. saw on stage, sure, this is like, you guys were on, saw this really, I, I, even, I interviewed you guys on this last year. This is a change, it's, it's now gone mainstream. Mm -hmm. What is your view on this as, it, as reInvent now? Because last year, just whispers of this, not, it wasn't even on the main stage. Yeah, that's true. Um, when you say mainstream, it makes me think of <laughs> like, like the main premise, well, I don't know if it's the main premise, but a major premise of um, the keynote yesterday. Um, with the announcement of those three tiers for Gen AI, to me that, I mean, that helps to provide structure that I think is much needed. Mm -hmm. It helps to kind of demystify it yeah. by showing the different tiers or the different layers and where the AWS mm -hmm. products and services for Gen AI fit into them. And what I found was that, or at least my opinion is that, that's really interesting dichotomy because it's adding structure but at the same time, that structure is based on options and flexibility, yeah. uh, which is right up AWS's alley. It's yeah, very I, smart. And I think even you know how they started the keynote off with storage. I mean, who yeah. reinvents storage? Yeah. Okay. But the Express One is a direct uh, uh, illustration of how you can build around S3 
mm -hmm. to make it go faster and reduce the cost. Now, because data yeah. is now part of it. So this is back to you now. Now big data you've been doing, but now it's, it's changed. Yeah. It, you, the usability is going to be faster, lower latency. Lower latency on packets, but also lower latency on answers. So you have two latency dimensions now. This is a new phenomenon. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and, and we're deployed on AWS, and um, some of the things that have been barriers for especially financial services companies to go on the cloud um, are uh, primarily th things like latency, throughput, and security. Those three hurdles are the big hurdles that any financial services company needs to address before we can successfully go to the cloud. Um, and if we consider the use case, the response has to come back within tens of milliseconds because it's while the transaction is being approved that we have to do all the computation and do the calculation and, and return the result uh, while uh, the customer is waiting either at an uh, online store or a physical store. So uh, the, the big challenge was how to, do we do this at scale and with the latency that is required from us at the SLA we provide the customer. So the good part was we were able to work very closely with AWS professional services mm -hmm. uh, to uh, make that happen. We brought them in early in the game and uh, re-architected the entire system from monolithic uh, system to more a microservices based system, which is elastic and uh, cloud native and that partnership was very, very successful and then we've extended that partnership. When did that journey start? What year was that? That was almost uh, three years back. Okay, got it, so and you're still on that journey. We're still on that journey. Uh, we have deployed the application worldwide uh, in multiple regions and uh, throughout that journey we've uh, not only strengthened the partnership with AWS, but we brought in new partners also like Persistent to help us get uh, better at delivering and improve our velocity and improve our, uh, the speed with which we deploy software onto the cloud. What's the relationship with Persistent that you guys have? You brought them in uh, when and what was their role? So Persistent was uh, brought in, I would say, uh, close to a year back uh, uh, to help develop our software and uh, we are a product development company, mm -hmm. and the good part about Persistent is that uh, their focus is on product development, uh, not a genetic uh, uh, system integrator, if yeah. you were. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, matches our needs very well, so we were able to successfully partner with them and uh, deliver results that are much better than some previous partners we were using earlier. If you're talking about this as obviously a competitive advantage for Persistent, but you're starting to see the levels of providers out there that from a services, professional services standpoint. Coding's huge, right? Mm -hmm. And knowing the tools and the platform also matters. Uh, how important is that for companies out there who are, who, are, who are probably obvious either already mandating a Gen AI strategy and or bottoms up um, data engineering or other I say replumbing. What do you want? Whatever word you want to call it. Refactoring, mm -hmm. resetting. I mean, yeah. <laughs> rebuilding. I mean, we saw yesterday you can move a thousand Java apps in two days, and then mm -hmm. soon to be .NET to Linux. I mean, that would, to me in the keynote, that was just like, okay, yeah. What's next? Schema changes? Full yeah, schema I don't know. change? Oh, I, don't I mean, know. I mean, this is where we are. Well, it is a big differentiator yeah. for us. You know, we say um, we have engineering DNA, or we were born digital, right? Um, and what that means is, with, with, with our focus on those capabilities, as it has been since the very beginning, we were really able to transform at scale. Um, we're able to provide customization at scale and to help customers drive outcomes um, that they're looking to drive. And then you throw in our collaboration with AWS on Code Whisper, for example, and our expertise there, and that only just, it, it yeah. pours gas on the fire when it comes to yeah. driving more efficiencies. And it basically um, accelerates the creative intellect capital of the people. Certainly I does. Mean, it, humans plus AI is greater than AI. We would say that in the queue. It's true, it's true. What are the use cases that you're seeing that you're being, that's being enabled now? What, talk about some of the, the new things that are popping up because you know, the trend we're seeing in the, in the cube as we're reporting the, the, the generative AI goodness that's happening, there's low hanging fruit, put a wrapper around something, data's laying around, as we were saying last night, and you've mm -hmm. turned that data into, into some value, either because you can do it faster, and then this new kind of reasoning, it's called kind of new, I call it native 
AI, new capabilities emerge, could be aggregation of data. What use cases are you seeing from stuff that you've instantly moved on and things that you're looking at building that wouldn't have been possible? Yeah, so, so certainly um, some of the excitement in the industry is around uh, using uh, generative AI for a number of use cases and some of them are low hanging fruit. Uh, we spoke about developer productivity, we, there's customer experience, uh, making it more personalized for customers, making better recommendations for customers. And um, I think one of the interesting use cases that uh, is more for the financial domain uh, than other domains is to do the same thing for transactions as uh, has been done for languages. So if we look at uh, how large language models work, uh, they basically take a sequence of words and predict the next word. And then once that's predicted, that sequence is taken and the next word is predicted. Now one can um, move from there to taking a sequence of transactions and then predicting the next transaction. And if the actual transaction is far away in terms of vector space from the predicted transaction, we know that it has some probability of fraud. So um, applying the same techniques in other domain areas I think is going to be a growing area for the whole industry and the whole community and I think that's one of the reasons why there's so much excitement yeah. in this yeah. space. You know, I'm, I'm not smiling because I'm, and it, I'm just, we love these, this new, these new ideas that are actually possible now. They're attainable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, I got to flip the coin on the other side and talk about the bad guys have the tools too, right? So how do you guys look at the security equation? Because right now the arms race of value is, okay, I can move fast too, so could the bad guys. Because now, mm -hmm. okay, what if they can detect that? And I'm not going to say bring AGI into the conversation because I don't think that's really the right conversation. It's not ready yet. But th th that is a big possibility of, like say, zero day exploits are being f figured out. I mean, the hackers are using the tools too. What do you guys, how do you guys handle that? What's the mindset? What's some of the things that you see around the, the other side of the security coin? No, that's, that's absolutely right because uh, there's uh, all the way from deep fakes to <laughs> impersonate and get somebody's identity to better ways for uh, the bad guys to uh, penetrate systems. So it's, it's a very diverse set of uh, new attacks that are coming and will be coming our ways. So in some sense it uh, reminds me <laughs> of uh, this uh, ongoing arms race, this uh, spy yeah. versus spy yeah. comics, you know, <laughs> you're always trying to outdo the other one. <laughs> but uh, This makes uh, it fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's stressful. So, <laughs> so, so we made some acquisitions in that space yeah. also, in terms of uh, uh, making the security better. Mm -hmm. All our value added services are focused on cyber and intelligence, mm -hmm. and uh, that's going to be a growing area and a very important area for us to continue to invest in and make yeah. acquisitions in, uh, in order to make that arms race yeah. uh, in the favor of the good guys yeah, versus yeah. the bad yeah. guys. And I think that's, I, I've been a big advocate of you now seeing the positive aspect of the, the good team to win, the tools that can be there. Um, the question I have for you on, uh, is the team makeups, how you put development teams together. I know you got the partnership with Persistent. Mm -hmm. um, data engineering is a big topic we've been having on theCUBE all week. Um, platform engineering's been happening for over a year and, and more, SRE, we all know DevOps has happened, you know, cloud has happened, okay. But platform engineering is the new term for setting up the platforms, whether it's Kubernetes clusters, standing up more clusters and inference clusters. Um, Data engineering is a new concept that's been, we've been talking about for about a year. Uh, it's becoming more sharper and focused as data becomes the key architectural design piece to feed the developers who want to, we think we shift left with data or have more data in the pipeline where they can manage data policy at the point of coding. Yeah. Whether it's code assistance or Q or whatever, mm -hmm. we're going to see more of that embedded in. Um, how do you look at the team makeup at MasterCard when you look at how to put that future team together? Um, same game, but maybe new formations, new plays. Um, yeah, so data is uh, fundamentally the key to everything, right? The actual code that the models runs is, is not that large in terms of lines of code, but it's the data that makes the difference and, and the fortunate part is that MasterCard has a huge amount of data worldwide that helps us uh, yeah. get better, learn better, and uh, machine learning is all about having good 
data and being able to leverage that successfully. So all throughout the organization, it's a fundamental core concept that we use. And in addition to that being throughout the organization, we've also established at the global level yeah. uh, uh, a special data and analytics organization that just focuses not just leveraging yeah. MasterCard data, but our customers' data also, and building a solution that then is very valuable uh, for the end customer. So MasterCard's revenue streams come from three sources. One is, of course, from the network. The other one is from value-added services, and the third one is from data and analytics, and uh, it's, a, it's a huge focus for us. Drew, as we wind down the, the segment here, first of all, thank you for sharing that insights into mm -hmm. your, your company's uh, plans and, and how you approach it. Persistent, you guys have a great, great uh, case here. We're starting to see AI take on hard problems, not just write copy for marketing, right. right? You see that, you know, obviously, uh, you know, that's the demo as you see. But with Q and all these things coming out, you know, this is this hard AI problems coming. Um, talk about what you guys do on this, at this scale with other customers. What's the persistent um, story now with this Gen AI wave coming? You get the, you get the experience coming into this wave, mm -hmm. so that's going to give you a, an advantage. Um, what are you guys doing now with customers and, and MasterCard in particular? How's this, this relationship developing? Well, um, we are, um, we do a lot of communicating with our customers. It's our collaboration with AWS though that is really helping us to, um, to tackle these new problems that are coming on. And what I mean by that is um, we have regular, the, stake, the stakeholders from our CTO's office and the appropriate stakeholders at AWS have regular conversations, around, a regular cadence around Gen AI. And through those forums, we're able to come to them with things we're hearing from our customers. We're always seeking the voice of the customer. Um, we use that information to, uh, to, to really let the folks at AWS know what's coming, what we're hearing. They react appropriately in terms of feature changes and, and developments and things like that. But when it comes to like where the rubber meets the road is we're trying to drive um, experimentation with our customers when it comes to Gen AI. And what I mean by that is, we just <clears throat> signed a strategic collaboration agreement with AWS specific to generative AI. And what that means is they are providing um, increased investment and persistent in exchange for us um, making commitments to grow that business. And a part of that is funding proofs of concept for customers like MasterCard and others. So we're really encouraging that. Yeah. We, want, we want to plant those seeds. Yeah. We want to help customers deploy their use cases faster uh, so um, they can drive the outcomes that they're looking for faster. The POC, we're back to the good motions of having proof of concepts, get that experimentation going, iterate through it, and, and, and kind of continue. Final question for both of you guys as we wrap, because I want to get this out there. The role of inference is huge. And we've said in the cube, we've heard this at KubeCon, inference is the killer app in this whole Gen AI I think, because you train stuff, but you're inferencing, getting to that value, low latency answers, or getting to a start point to be creative or solve a problem faster, not waiting for a response, prompting again. We see a latency speed game to getting more answers faster, whether it's fraud here or something there. What's, the, what's your view on inference? Do you agree it's the killer app? It's the, it's the key? Absolutely, absolutely, because um, um, what I described as uh, uh, what we deployed on AWS is all uh, the inferencing side. We actually developed the model and trained the model in our data centers. And once the model is, has been developed, trained, and tested, and, and we've done all the evaluations on, of which model is the best model, then we take that and deploy it on AWS for inferencing. Mm. And that's the part that is most critical for us for deploying on AWS because the number of benefits we get. One of those, as an example, is many countries now have on-soil requirements. So we have to be in a region and keep the data in that region. And uh, being on AWS, we can leverage the data centers that AWS has, uh, has throughout the world. Yeah, yeah. And it gives us the latency, <laughs> gives us the throughput. Uh, so <laughs> inferencing is what we have on AWS and the, the, the rest, the training, the, the model creation is still in our data centers. So we can unpack that for another hour. 
Minute, Drew, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. Thank you very and much. Good to see you again, and yeah. congratulations on the call out on the keynote with Adam Selesky and the, the success you guys have with your coding. Appreciate it. Thank you very right. much. CUBE coverage here on the ground, on location. We've got our Palo Alto studio with the live stream. Back to you, Vice Palo Alto. We'll be back with more on location coverage after this short break.